It is now my pleasure to introduce this morning's speaker, Mrs. Kat Cole. She's the group president at Focus Brands and former president of Cinnabon, Inc. As the president, she built Cinnabon into a bakery brand with more than $1 billion in sales, and I've contributed to that uh, <laughs> more than I should. Uh, and the presence of more than 30 countries. The Focus brands include the following franchises that we're all very familiar with, Moe's, Slotsky's, Annie Ann's, Carvel, McAllister Deli, in addition to Cinnabon. As the group president, Gat, uh, Cat oversees more than 4,000 uh, of these franchises. Cat is a member of the Young Global Leader of the World Economic Forum, and she has started a foundation to fund creative and sustainable approaches, approaches to education and self-sufficiency. She's also the co-founder of the Changers of Commerce, which is a leading social movements agency. Uh, although she's still young in her career, she has received a number of accolades, and here are a, a list of some of those. In 2008, she was the Motivator of the Year Award, uh, received the Motivator of the Year Award by the Elliott Leadership Institute. In 2010, uh, she received the Georgia Restaurant Association Crystal of Excellence Award. 2007, she received the Women's Food Service Forum Volunteer of the Year Award. And she's also been listed among Fortune's 40 Under 40 for top young business leaders. She has been listed in CNBC's Next 25 List Innovators for Leaders and Disruptors for 2014, which is traditionally dominated by tech startups and a few financial service groups. And she was only one of two of leaders from the food service companies. Kat resides here in Atlanta. Please join me in, welcome, in welcoming Kat Cole. Uh, welcome, and good for you for taking time out of your morning to spend time with each other and invest in yourself and invest in your community. Uh, I, I want to share with you a couple of lessons from really unexpected places that have shaped my leadership philosophy and certainly impacted my ability to make a difference in my community and my family uh, and probably most relevant to you in my businesses. So first I'll give you a little overview of what I do today. So you heard Cinnabon, the disturbingly delicious cinnamon roll company where we make pastries the size of your face and bring them to the market in all kinds of different ways. So, and I'm happy to answer any questions uh, about the brand and the turnaround that, that we accomplished, but I took it over about four and a half years ago was the president of that brand uh, for four and a half years, right at the end of the recession. And the brand was in les toilettes, let's say. Uh, the brand was actually still quite famous, but the business model was fundamentally broken. It's a small, low average unit volume retail business to begin with. So there's not a lot of fat to take out. Well, there's a lot of fat in the cinnamon rolls, but there's not a lot of fat in the P&L. And when you have multiple years of double digit sales declines, when your basic business model is located in malls and airports, and when people don't have discretionary income, they don't shop and they don't travel, and so there's no humans to sell to, you're dealing with massive margin compression that you really can't escape from uh, without making probably very poor decisions, cutting labor, cutting quality, cutting your hours. You, know, you sort of chip away and sort of wind yourself to the bottom, literally like the toilet bowl effect. And that had happened for years in the Cinnabon business, add to the fact that it's a franchise system, not a corporately owned system. And so the people running those brick and mortar businesses in 61 countries, by the way, uh, have put their own money into it. And some of them are big giant conglomerates and they have many different franchises, but by and large, they are families that have invested their life savings or their retirement into their dream of becoming some form of an entrepreneur. Many of them own anywhere from one to three. They don't own 10 or 20. They're not big giant corporations. So they typically don't have the capital strength to withstand that many years of back-to-back -back sales decline. So just the basic brick and mortar franchise business was dealing with that as a sustained challenge over many years. And actually, it wasn't quite, it wasn't very strong leading up to the recession. The brand had not reinvested in product innovation. It had become quite irrelevant in terms of health trends because of the Atkins fad, if you all remember. And uh, I love Atkins. Rourke, our uh, private equity firm, owns Atkins. So I eat my Atkins bars, and then I go eat Cinnabon, and, and it all balances out. Uh, but the brand just really hadn't kept pace. But luckily, the brand and consumers' minds still had tremendous emotional equity because of the memory of spending time in a mall with friends or family or going during the holidays to get a Cinnabon cinnamon roll. So the brand had emotional connection, which is what most businesses and brands beg to have. They spend 
millions of dollars, tens or hundreds of millions of dollars to try to create an emotional connection when their fundamental business is working. We had a broken business model but still had people that loved us all around the world. The problem was when I took over the business, I would say, when's the last time you had Cinnabon? And they'd say, oh, about 10 years ago. I'm like, oh, that is a frequency problem <laughs> if, I've ever, you know, if I've ever heard one. So, so we had a frequency issue. We had people who just didn't come often. We had locations that had deferred capital investment, so they were tired, they were old, they looked irrelevant. And then we had unit level economics that didn't work. And so when you're a franchise business, the ULE has to be incredibly strong in order for you to compel others to invest in the future. So there wasn't a lot that was good when you looked at the business side, but there was so much that was good from a consumer sentiment side. And that's why I got really excited about taking over the business. Uh, the business, as I mentioned, was in 61 countries. Even then, a couple of those countries, there were only one. So there's one in Mongolia. There are now two. We basically soak up every royalty dollar that we get and just flying out there. Probably not the smartest expansion strategy. Uh, and then we had really saturated, very thoughtfully expanded markets, such as the Middle East, where Cinnabon had been for 20 years. We've got 140 locations in Saudi Arabia alone. So an inconsistent international expansion strategy also. A lot of flag planting, which is something that plagues uh, businesses that start to go overseas, in particular retail businesses, because you get excited about seeing that next flag in your office when it might not be the smartest move from a business perspective to expand your brand, but emotionally it makes you feel really good. So uh, when I took over the business, that was also a challenge, was disparate growth, not concentric, uh, not necessarily thoughtful in all places around the globe. So there was a little bit of an international footprint issue, a lot of a business model issue, but still a brand that people loved. And when you have that equation, you've actually a lot of, got a lot of very good things going for you. One is that the problems in the business are, for the most part, obvious. So you're not having to stand in front of your board of directors or your employees or a group of people and, and convince them that things aren't going right. It's much harder to innovate and to create step change in an organization that has had sustained success, in my opinion. And so this was a business that was sort of going this way. You just point out to everyone that the train is going on a 45 degree slope <laughs> from here to here. And they say, yeah, you're probably right. That probably means the things we aren't doing aren't working. And so I was able to leverage that many years of challenges to warm the community up, the franchisees, uh, the employees, the investors, the stakeholders in the business to help them see we needed not slight incremental change, but radical change to evolve the business, but not radical change in terms of becoming someone we're not. And so we just spent 60, 90 days in the bakeries. I took over the business, did nothing but work in the business. Wash dishes, made cinnamon rolls. It's a lot harder than you would think, as you can imagine. Uh, and I grew up in operations, so that part was easy for me, but what was hard was getting out what were the right first things to impact. And uh, we made a couple of really important changes. One, the brand was famous for this giant classic cinnamon roll. Who knows how many calories are in a classic Cinnabon cinnamon roll? By a raise of hand. Free Cinnabon for you, if you guess. <laughs> you might not want it after I tell you the calories. 1,500, 1,200, 2,000, 2,300. I love it. You guys are making my job so easy. 880. Well, look, it's like a light dessert now. <laughs> 880 calories. And so what I have found is, by the way, everyone thinks it's 2,000. So when they see 880, they go, oh, <laughs> you know, that's not so bad. So low expectations. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I um, have been a fan of low expectations for a long time. So, um, so, so that still, even though it's lower than people think, is still a highly caloric dessert. Um, but it's a highly delicious dessert also, and there's a lot of things that have a lot more calories than 880 that many of us indulge in occasionally. And, uh, and so, relatively speaking, it wasn't too much out of the ballpark, but the issue, as I mentioned, was frequency. When you have a retail business that's already, its footprint is in an infrequent venue, the average mall shopper, frequent mall shopper, comes once a month. The average QSR, so think fast food, is often, if you're a breakfast consumer, is two to three times a week. If you're a lunch consumer, is one time a week. And I, the best I could even possibly have from you is once a month. Then add to that that we're an indulgent, infrequent brand in an infrequent venue, and the average Cinnabon guest visits two to three times a year. And that's for people who love us. Most people visit once a year. That's part of why we're located in high foot traffic venues with unique feet. So I may only get you once a year, but there's lots of unique people coming through 
those venues. And so when a business model has that structure, infrequent venue, infrequent visits, there are so many fundamental marketing practices and communication practices that must be thought of differently because I don't get to see you often. And oh, by the way, the franchise business, even though we had a big footprint, was quite small. And so there's no McDonald's size marketing budget. To market about 600 locations in just 50 states, the advertising fund was barely over $2 million. That's not a lot. <laughs> McDonald's, as an example, will spend $100 million in just a region for just a tight concentric group for a year. And so the ability to market, the fundamental frequency of the consumer, the basic business model, all of that was essentially flawed and not working effectively together. So the question then is, well, do you just put a bullet in it? <laughs> or do you actually do something about it? And to me, the potential was so obvious. Once I got into the business, I asked a couple of key questions. One was, what do people ask for that we can't give them? When do we have to say no? It's one of the most powerful questions you can ask your business at a minimum on an annual basis to the people who are close to the consumer. Because if you're getting requests, for some reason the consumer thinks you should or could be offering it, and if you have to say no consistently, that might be a market opportunity. One of the things we were having to say no to was do we have smaller portions? Now, actually the brand had a mini bond, which is only 320 calories for 25 years. But for some reason, the leadership of the brand had never mandated it be carried consistently. So the irony was we had the answer to the number one request of the consumer and we simply hadn't mandated it. The reason we hadn't mandated it was we were a franchise system. And so the franchisees said, why on earth would I put something on my menu that allows people to spend $2.50 when right now I have something that forces them to spend $3.50? So these are really smart business people with their life savings involved. But it took a leader to come in and say, I know you're afraid of trade down. I know you're afraid of X percent of people spending 250 instead of 350 in an already very compressed economic environment, but what you aren't seeing is the hundreds of people or thousands of people that you aren't getting at all, the zero dollars they're spending, because you're not offering them the lower price, lower calorie, smaller, more portable, more shareable, fill in the blank, all of the attributes that the market wants, because you aren't offering that. And oh, by the way, when you have that smaller entry tier product, they might actually get a nice coffee or a beverage that many of which of our locations were pretty famous for. So by simply listening to the consumer, and, but via listening to the franchisees and the employees, we just said, we'll just make whatever we already have national. It created a 6% sales lift. The brand had not seen that type of a sales lift in 15 years. One product. Now there was a fundamental issue, which was we didn't have a really good mechanism to tell people about it. So one of the ways we did that is we partnered with Burger King launched the mini bond in 7,100 Burger Kings, which as you can imagine to my franchisees felt quite threatening and frightening because we had a branded product in another restaurant's menu. But not only did it create an incremental 3% sales lift for my entire franchise system, it provided almost a two to three X EBITDA growth for the brand. So it benefited, it was the rising tide that lifted all boats. But I say that in a two sentence description, but you can imagine the emotional work, the mental exercise, the business cases, the travel, the conversations, building advocacy, helping franchisees understand how something that felt so, so threatening was probably going to be the single greatest lever we could pull to materially grow the business. It also put Cinnabon on the map as a food service licensor for the first time where we made Cinnabon branded products for other restaurant chains. All of a sudden we were being called by the nation and then beyond the United States largest restaurant chains to say, well, can you make me a cheesecake? Can you make me a nice coffee? Can you make me a beverage? And then we said, wow, that that could really be a, a big business model for us. Maybe we should resource our organization to not just answer those phone calls, but go make them and build that channel of the business. And so Cinnabon today is about 1.3 billion in branded uh, total consumer product sales. Only 25% of that is the core legacy franchise business. Yet it's what we're famous for. 75% of the 1.3 billion comes from innovation channels, primarily developed over the last four years. Making products for grocery, if you've had uh, Cinnabon International Delight Coffee Creamer, it is disturbingly delicious. Cinnabon Vodka, so if you want fat-free Cinnabon, you can have our vodka, Uh, if you're into that kind of thing. Uh, We have Cinnabon K-Cup, so we partner with Green Mountain. Cinnabon is the number, depending on the month, number one or two flavor 
uh, in the Green Mountain coffee system, which is a pretty big deal considering they're the largest single serve player. And so we got really smart about what we owned as an equity. Then we got honest about where we had the permission to travel and where we didn't. We put those things together, developed a group, uh, a team, and a strategy, and went after those channels. And today we are literally the largest food for, uh, restaurant based licensor in the world. Uh, with about a billion in licensing. And so we did that with Cinnabon. Franchisees improved their financial health. Best four and a half years they've had in literally 20 years. And now I've recently moved over to be the group president of Focus Brands, which is focused on all global channels for all six of our brands. So that's what I do. That's a little bit of the Cinnabon story and the innovation story. So if you have business questions around that, I'm happy to answer uh, those. But probably what's more interesting is how I got there. And I am, I just turned 37. I took over Cinnabon when I was 31, about to thir turn 32 as a, a president of that company and helped shepherd all of the growth I just described. And, uh, and so it was really interesting having such a young point of view relative to my peers, but having such big, deep, complex, systemic business challenges. And so I get a lot of questions around, well, what sets you up to do that? And how did you know to do these things? And, and the lessons truly have come from the most unexpected places. So the first place uh, my business lessons have come from is my mother. Uh, my mom, when I was nine years old, came to me and said, that's it, I'm done, we're leaving. I uh, am the oldest of three girls. I have two younger sisters. And what she meant was we were leaving my father. Um, my father uh, was and is a very sweet and wonderful man. But at the time, he was an alcoholic and a horrible father and husband. And my mother had essentially been raising us on her own, and I was the father figure at the age of nine. And so she finally got the courage to leave. My mother was a secretary. She was the youngest of six children. She herself had been raised by a single parent since her father died when she was three. So we had no resources, no money, no place to go. Literally everyone on both sides of my family lived in trailer parks. They could barely support themselves. My father actually, ironically, had the best job of anyone on both sides of my family. And at the age of nine, when my mom told me we were leaving, at the age of nine, I did not cry. I did not get upset. I looked at her at the age of nine and said, what took you so long at the age of nine? And while I didn't know it was a business lesson then, as I grew up and reflected upon my very unique past, I realized that was the first place where I was fundamentally shaped and it, and it, and it shows up today in my leadership style, which is the people who are closest to the action or the transaction, wherever the action is, wherever the, the thing is happening that makes money in a business, Whoever is closest to the action knows what the right thing to do is in the business long before you do. I knew it was time to leave long before my mom came to those terms. She might have known it, and she was the leader that could make the decision, but she wasn't close enough to it frequently enough to really say this is unacceptable. My only best alternative is to go. She was filled with other inputs that essentially netted out to make her believe it was still better to stay than to go. And I see that happen all the time in business, when people stay with a, a, a job, or they keep an employee they shouldn't, or they don't hire an employee that they should, or they don't sell off a business division, and they don't buy it, because they're not close enough to the action to really be compelled to pull that trigger, or to rip off the Band-Aid, as I like to say. And so as you, as you look at your career and your business, the trick is staying as close to the transaction as you can, or as is appropriate, and if you can't, having someone that's very, very close to you staying insanely close to the action. That is why when I took over the company as president, I did nothing but go work with the employees. Because I believe so deeply that that's where most answers always lie in a business. Now, it's not my job to be the manager of the locations. It's not my job to be the district manager of those managers or the regional VPs. I need those layers to execute the business. So I don't want to take their authority away. I just want to tether myself in at a high enough frequency that I can be meaningfully moved by what the people who are creating the transaction are experiencing so I can support the things that need to happen or ask thoughtful questions that lead us to a better place to make really smart decisions as a leadership team. And I learned that from my mom. Uh, we ended up leaving. My mom fed uh, my family of three girls on a food budget of $10 a week for three years. So I got to see this example of leadership that was not only positive and kind, but just scrappy. She could figure things out and make it happen. And she would always ask herself, if not me, who, if not now, when? I learned that from her. And we ate a lot of beanie weenies and potted meat, and it was cool, and we liked it, and she never complained. 
And so I often tell people in business or peers or people I'm developing, when they'll ask about my style, I'll share that it's so unfair um, for many people, if they're competing against me in business or if I'm trying to recruit or hire or, or buy a new division, it's unfair for anyone to have to compete against me because I grew up with that as my leadership example. I mean, it's, it's, it's a blessing on so many levels to grow up and see that day in and day out, the grace, the composure, the ability to make tough decisions, and then see it all play out relatively positively. So that, that's sort of the first bucket of lessons from an unexpected place that is translated very literally into the way I show up in business every day. Started working when I was 15 in malls, got recruited to be a hostess at Hooters when I was 17 and in high school. I turned 18, I became a waitress at Hooters and rocked the orange shorts and served chicken wings and it was a blast growing up in Jacksonville, Florida. Um, but that was not my dream to be at Hooters. My dream was to go to school and be the first person in my family to get accepted to college, which I was. Uh, to get my engineering degree, which I started, electrical engineering and computer sciences, and then my dream was to go on to law school. I don't know why. I'd never met an engineer and I'd never met an attorney, because um, I grew up in sort of this sort of podunk, redneck area. But I had seen things about them on TV, and I had heard things about those roles, and those two things, to me, seemed the most fancy and the farthest away from where I was at the time. There was no other reason. There was no good reason. I had no context. I had no frame of reference. They just seemed like very professional roles, and I wanted to be as far away from where I was in every way, both physically and in terms of how I lived my life, as possible. Uh, I had seen a, a paint can in a garage once that said DuPont, and I thought, that must be a big company. So I became obsessed with working for DuPont Chemicals. And so that was my dream. Those were my goals when I was a teenager. Uh, started my electrical engineering uh, career or learning academic experience at the University of North Florida. And a few things happened between the ages of 18 and 19, my first two years of college. One was I continued to work at Hooters. I had to pay my way through college. I had a partial scholarship. And one day the, the cooks quit. So I went in the back and filled their role. People were in the restaurant, they had ordered food, the cooks left, I don't know why they left, somebody stole their weed or something and they all got mad and <laughs> left. And, uh, and so, you know, what do you do? You're the server, people have placed orders and the peop the, it's an open kitchen, you can kind of tell when the cooks are gone. <laughs> so there's, you know, fryers frying and flat top is steaming and there are no humans back there. And so a couple of us, uh, myself and one other Hooters girl and the manager said, okay, we'll go back there. So we went in the back and started cooking the chicken wings. Uh, and it's easy, when they float, they're done. And so it's not that hard. <laughs> and so I did that for two reasons. I did, well, I'll tell you why I didn't do it. I didn't do it because I wanted to build an illustrious restaurant resume. I did it, one, because I wanted to be helpful. And selfishly, uh, if the food didn't get to the table, there would be no payment, therefore no tips, therefore no bill paying for me. So it was selfishly motivated. I was also curious to see if I could do it. There has always been this curiosity, probably because of where I came from, to see if I could do something that was different. So I was curious, I wanted to be helpful, and it was self-serving. So I did that that day, and then I realized that was pretty fun, and so whenever they needed extra kitchen help or someone called out, I would go back and work kitchen shifts. And then the bartender called out, and then the manager had to leave early, and in a short period of time, I had essentially worked every job in the restaurant. Effectively, I had built a very impressive entry-level restaurant resume, even though that was not at all my desire or goal. Fast forward to now my second year in college, and uh, I get a phone call from the general manager that hired me, who herself had been a Hooters girl, and she was now running a single uh, restaurant doing about $5 million in sales a year, and was about to be promoted to become the regional manager to run the entire region. And she called me and said, you know, Hooters is opening its first franchise in Australia, and uh, we think you should go. You've worked every job in this business. You already train new hires here. You're incredibly balanced. You can handle chaos without freaking out. And we need that to go to a country where we've never done business. And I said, sure, that sounds awesome. What 19-year-old doesn't say awesome? That sounds great um, with the opportunity to travel to Australia. The problem was I had never been on a plane. I did not have a passport. I had only been out of the state of Florida twice in my life. But I still said yes. Um, I'm not sure why. I just believed I could figure it out. So the next day, I bought a plane ticket, my first ever plane ticket, flew to Miami, stood in line, got my passport in one day, and then flew back, and then eventually, uh, a couple weeks later, flew to Australia, where I stayed for 40 days and helped to open the franchise. They never knew I didn't have the passport when I said yes. I didn't lie, it was just a sin of omission. I didn't want them to worry and be nervous. And, uh, and, and I truly, at that point, thought, 
this is a once in a lifetime experience. You know, who's ever gonna ask me, especially with my background, to do something like that ever again? And how often are, is a restaurant company going to go launch a franchise on another continent in another country? Little did I know I would be uh, start doing that very often. And so uh, 30 days after I got back, they said, you did such a great job, will you go to Central America and open the first ever Hooters in Central America and, and in Sorrentes in, in Mexico City? I said, sure, no problem. So went down and was a part of that team that opened that restaurant. And then they said, you know, when you, I came back, I made up my classes. Remember, I'm in college at this point, so I'm making up classes, kind of doing double duty. My professors were very flexible working with me. Um, and then they said, well, we'd like you to open a few here in the U.S. I opened some restaurants in Orlando, opened Hooters in Salt Lake City, Utah. That was the most interesting Hooters opening I have ever done. Fascinating uh, and beautiful out there. And so, uh, so I had these very rich, really cool experiences by the time I was, before I even turned 20 years old, opening businesses. And eventually they said, you know, you've done so many of these. And I, and I was doing this almost every other month or every three months. Uh, you're doing such a great job. We want you to now lead the teams. And I said, sure, no problem. They said, but we want you to go down to uh, Buenos Aires in Argentina and lead the team to launch the first Hooters franchise in all of South America. You need to set up the supply chain, train the franchisee, hire the employees, bring the training team, open the restaurant, and ensure it gets open. I said, okay, no problem. Uh, by that point, I turned 20 and had so many interesting experiences at these openings, as you can imagine, uh, having to adjust the menu real time, having to redefine the brand in all of these countries, the word Hooters does not translate in any language. So when people say KS, you know, when they say, what does that mean? You're like, well, where do I start? Um, and, and so interestingly, it built a very powerful marketing muscle because every time I entered a country, we had to think about what do we stand for? And how does that connect with the consumer here? And what's their frame of reference for sports, for bars, for casual food, for this? We had to really think about every element of the business and how it did or did not connect to what already existed in the marketplace and then where we could or and wanted to shape what they thought about the business. What did we need to protect as a brand and what could be evolved and changed to be relevant to that market at that time? And so I didn't realize it, but I was building a consumer marketing and global branding muscle at the time. I just thought I was just figuring it out. Every time they dropped us in a country, we were highly unsophisticated. We were literally planting flags. We didn't go down with a, a, a primer that said, this is how to reposition your brand in every market. It was like, here's the recipes. Here's the training schedule for bartenders and cooks and employees and managers. Go do it and make sure the building doesn't burn down. And, and so it was those experiences of opening the businesses and repositioning the brand that I learned so much about asking the right questions, not just in another country, with a new location, with a new, franchi a new franchisee, it is so unimportant to have the right answers. Truly, it is not important because at the speed of change of the marketplace today and the diversity of the markets where you might do business, if you had the right answer yesterday, it is wrong for tomorrow, almost consistently. The real muscle, the real leadership strength is asking the right questions everywhere you go so that you get the most relevant answer that can help you have the highest likelihood of success so that your actions are optimized for that time and that place. And shockingly, I learned that from Hooters restaurants. Uh, opened a lot of, of businesses, ended up failing college, as you can imagine, because I was never there. And so I dropped out at the age of 20. I moved to Atlanta, that's how I got here, because I was offered a corporate job to run global employee training for the company. So I took that job at the age of 20, moved up as the company grew. Uh, I always tell people, you know, joining a growing company has its benefits, no matter how unsophisticated they may be. And so uh, they needed people, and they needed people that knew the brand. And I might not have been the most qualified on a piece of paper, uh, academically or with pedigree or experience, but I was insanely qualified uh, as, it re as it related to my actual accomplishments and my ability to get things done in the organization. And so I became one of the five vice presidents at the age of 26, the year we hit 800 million in revenue. We grew that company to a billion in revenue in 33 countries. Uh, we bought an airline, we ran an airline, and because that's a terrible idea, we sold an airline. Um, we ran it for four years, so I'm happy to answer anything about it, the FAA training we had to go through. Uh, we were fully vertically integrated as a company. We owned 70% of our own supply chain. We owned Naturally Fresh, or was Eastern Foods here in Atlanta, for those of you who might remember, then became Naturally Fresh. We made our own sauces and dressings and sold it to other companies. So that's where I got my multi-channel learning and muscle and learning about how to do something that's for your own brand, but the benefits of using that capacity to create incremental innovative revenue streams. Ironically, I learned that from Hooters. 
And so when people say, how, what does Hooters have to do with Cinnabon? And how did you go from one to the other? And one's these you know, 2.5 million average unit volume location, sports bar, the alcohol component, the socially acceptable sex appeal component, all, all of this. And then you, then you go to a little tiny cinnamon roll snack business. And, and as you can hear from the few examples I've shared, there are so many parallels to innovating, building, and expanding a consumer business. It doesn't matter what segment it's in. It doesn't matter if it's food, or apparel, or fragrance, or shoes, uh, or gadgets, or technology. If it is consumer facing, and you have to understand how consumers connect to a product, and their need states, and their usage occasions, and then what the brand stands for, and then where you have permission to travel, and then you think about the business model, and how you leverage your capacity to protect your business model, and give it longevity, and how you stand for something with consumers, it doesn't matter what industry it's in. So I learned some interesting lessons from Hooters uh, and, and eventually left, uh, as I mentioned, when I was 31 to become the COO and president of Cinnabon. But the final place where I learned the most interesting lessons was actually from Eastern Africa. Uh, I started getting involved in humanitarian uh, and philanthropic work, bless you, uh, when I was very young for lots of reasons. One, because I was traveling a ton, and so when I would come home, I didn't have a lot of friends that were soaking up my time, so I went to soup kitchens and shelters and hung out and volunteered, and that was literally my personal life uh, after I moved to Atlanta. I went through tough times when we changed CEOs at our company. We had a not-so-great executive in the company that worked for our CEO after our CEO passed away suddenly, and, and he had his favorite group, and he wanted to take over the company, and it was not such a great time, and so I had to get my sense of self and my sense of purpose from somewhere other than my job, because that wasn't going so well at the time. And I really believe in diversifying your purpose portfolio and getting your sense of self from more sources than just one. You shouldn't be just defined by your work or only defined by your family or only defined by your faith. The trick is to diversify a bit, because at any given point, one of those things is going to be going not so well, and one's probably going to be going very well. And it helps you be more consistently the best version of yourself in all areas of your life. That's true for business, diversifying revenue streams. It's, it's true for humans, too. And uh, so I started volunteering that way, and it eventually led to me having a reputation for going into nonprofits, turning them around, building teams. And a friend of mine was an author, and she was traveling in Rwanda, and she asked if I could come to Rwanda uh, to help her and the president of Rwanda, Paul Kagame, with women's initiatives. I had been involved in the Women's Food Service Forum for a long time, and I said, yeah, sure, why not? I'd never been to Africa. <laughs> Um, I'd certainly never been to Rwanda, but interestingly, when she asked me to go, she said, can you be here December 10th? And it was the weirdest, sometimes the universe just slaps you in the face. I was already planning on being in South Africa for my first ever trip to open a Hooters restaurant, and my last day was December 9th there. And so I was coincidentally going to be on the continent of Africa 24 hours before she needed me to be in a different country, and that was... It was almost creepy you know, when, when that call came, and so I said, absolutely. So I went and, of course, fell in love with the people and the culture uh, and the challenges. And this was the, at that point, it was the 14th year um, after the genocide. And so anyone who was 20 years old, 30 years old, had grown up seeing that. And so feeling that and experiencing that and having someone selling you bread and you know that they were killing their neighbor or their family was killed by their neighbors uh, is a very intense emotional experience if you take the time to think about it, so I grew a deep appreciation uh, for humanitarian work in these parts of the world where the travesties are beyond what the typical developed world citizen uh, can even begin to imagine. And so I was drawn out there many times after. I went back to Rwanda many times, moved from women's initiative work to mentoring tech startups. I invest in a lot of tech startups and have for about eight years. And so I moved to uh, empowering technology evolution in, in Rwanda. And, uh, and then I had a friend say, come to Ethiopia, come to the Somali border of Ethiopia. And I said, sure, why not? I mean, there are a lot of reasons not to be on the Somali border of Ethiopia. Uh, but, but I went, and, uh, and there were two experiences, actually there were many, but two I'll share with you this morning to wrap, um, that, that shaped me deeply as it relates to business and leadership philosophy. And one was I, I brought with me several people who had never been to Africa. And the Somali border of Ethiopia is a horribly difficult way to experience what is an otherwise beautiful and complex continent for the first time. And so I bring my friends, and we're literally stepping over people who are dying. So we are in this small market at this small village, um, and there's a woman who has probably had her child two or three days ago, and they are both very clearly dying. When you're in that in environment, death is, there, there's, there's no question. This isn't a sick woman, this is a dying woman. And my friend freaks. 
she'd never seen something like that, and, and I literally stepped right over them. And she said, how can you do that? You can imagine the moral discussion that ensues. And I said, let me tell you something. And I pulled her aside and said, if you, she said, I'm going to give her my money. I'm going to give her my money. I'm going to bring her food. I'm going to do whatever I can. I said, if you do that, we will be physically swarmed and attacked by everyone in this area. So you're going to put my safety at risk and yours. And you're not going to have the money that we need to go buy the supplies for the much larger village of many more people that we will be able to not only impact, but help them save themselves. It's not that her life isn't important. It's that we have to make a decision with limited resources and time and think about our safety. And she looked at me and said, I don't care, because she was so emotionally affected by this and literally emptied her pockets and walked over and said, take this. I'm going to go get you water. And we were physically swarmed. And I don't fault her for it. I totally understand the emotional reaction to what appears to be an immediate need. And think about how often that happens in our personal lives and in our business. You have an opportunity. You have something you see. You got you to gotta do it. You go after it. And it takes a leader to say, let's be thoughtful about our limited resources. Let's be thoughtful about if we do this, we might not be able to do that. And are we OK with that? In this case, I was the leader and I failed. <laughs> um, and luckily, we emerged OK, and everything was all right. So we then go to the villages. So we pass this tiny village, and we're heading to the middle-sized village. And she said, I don't understand. I get the challenges of now helping the one person, but why did we pass the little village? There are hundreds of people. Well, we're going to one with 2,000 people, and we could use the same time and resources and impact double or triple the people. So this is about opportunity cost. And so we have to go where our, we have the greatest return on effort. And she said, but I just heard that there was a 5,000 village, 5,000 person village down the road. Why wouldn't we go there? Which was an excellent question. Because, and I'm paraphrasing one of my favorite uh, NGO and nonprofit leaders, uh, because you have to focus on things that are smart enough, uh, small enough to change, but big enough to matter. And there's a sweet spot in decision making and resource allocation that leaders must guide. It's got to be small enough to change, because why throw money and resources after something you actually can't impact? Or that's so systemically complicated that even if you feel as if you're impacting it temporarily, the minute you're gone, it forms back over itself. So too big is not OK. Now, that doesn't mean don't have big goals. It doesn't mean, say, I want to change the world, and I'm going to totally disrupt the marketplace. Have those beliefs. Have those goals. Have them everywhere. But don't miss the opportunity to actually make change that sticks along the way and realize that you could spend years going after the big goal and impacting nothing. Or you could spend days and weeks making, having smaller wins, making smaller impacts that actually build to, interestingly, the big goal that you want to accomplish. So we work with this middle village. We have this conversation with her. And it's incre the, the issues are so systemic. They have no money. The coffee prices have plummeted. So they pulled out coffee fields and planted a narcotic called chat that everyone chews. And it makes them totally worthless in terms of uh, work and energy. And then they sell it to the Somalis and to Al Qaeda. And it's just everything about it is bad. And anything that's bad grows without water. And so this thing grows <laughs> everywhere. It's, it's this cash crop. And so you've got people who are living off of chat. And they're not doing these other things that would help their health. They're not growing vegetables because they're growing chat. And so we're negotiating with them to pull out the chat and plant tomatoes and onions and lime trees. And my friend crosses her arm and says, I'm not negotiating. I literally feel like I'm negotiating with terrorists. Why would I invest my money in helping people build irrigation systems and training them when they're sitting here right in front of us chewing this narcotic and selling it? And I said, well, and this is so true in business. I dealt with this so many times with my franchisees. We have two options. We can either fold our arms and say all or nothing, my way, not your way that you've been living off of for decades or even centuries. But I'd like you to stop all that because I want you to do something different. Or we find a way to find, and please remember this phrase, compromises we can be comfortable with, but only in the name of progress. So don't compromise if there's no progress. And don't make compromises you can't be comfortable with and walk away from and feel good about. But if this is a compromise we can be comfortable with and it creates progress, we will be one of the few that actually make a difference. And you see this in our government, stalemates and issues where people won't 
make a difference. You see this in companies where leaders who maybe are legacy leaders and, and just are so afraid of hurting the baby and taking the eye off the ball. You see it where people who lead only innovation don't have appreciation for the legacy division of them. You see it all the time. You see it with us, with our own health as humans, the things we know we should do or we should trade off a little bit, and but we say, no, I'm not totally changing my life and who I am. So it, it's human nature. So we sat down and said, okay, because what we were doing was an irrigation project. The irrigation that we will work with you on, that they have to pay for and they have to do the work, but we will guide, uh, cannot water the chat. So whatever water we bring, it only can go to these new fields for the vegetation. They said deal. Of course they said deal. The plant doesn't need freaking water to grow, but it made my friend feel better. So I said don't water the chat. Um, and, <laughs> and sometimes you, you, know, you give people wins. It might not actually be a real win, but if it's a win to them, especially in negotiation, you, know, you think about that. So, uh, so they said okay. Then we said for every hectare of vegetation that grows, they didn't believe it would grow. For every hectare that grows, you will cut your chat fields by a third. And they agreed. We went back 18 months later. You wouldn't believe the vegetation that had grown. 50% of the chat fields were gone. Not only that, because we had focused on a village that could actually handle the change, small enough to change, but big enough to matter, they then went to the smaller village and taught them the same skills. And the big village was coming and buying the seedlings from the middle village. So by focusing on the right thing, we impacted everything. If we had focused on the wrong thing, we would have affected nothing. And I see this happen every day in the corporate world. People not focusing on the right thing, they're chasing, the work becomes the purpose of the work, do you know what I mean? Instead of asking, is it really making the difference that we want it to make? And I have all kinds of Cinnabon examples uh, of that, but those are two lessons um, that, that stood out to me so much. There's compromises I can be comfortable with, but only in the name of progress. Think about what I had to do to get the franchisees to move along. Trust me, there was a lot of bartering and a lot of negotiation. And okay, what do you need and what do I need to move the whole company along? Uh, and this concept of small enough to change and big enough to matter. Be comfortable and proud of small wins because they're often the, you know, the path to the big win. Uh, so I will stop there and open it up for questions if you have any here with the group. Bueller, Bueller, Fry, Fry. And we've got a uh, microphone. For oh, there's some over there. Be about Africa, Cinnabon, Undercover Boss. I'm happy to answer any questions I can legally answer about that. <laughs> Hi, Kat. Hi. Um, I'm impressed with your, your brand, your personal brand, if I may use that term. And I work in helping MBAs that have recently graduated in finding work. Many times they have certain ideas of what they want to accomplish, mm -hmm. and sometimes their backgrounds don't necessarily fit with those goals. You have talked about a number of things where you've put together a purpose portfolio and you've really looked at how you've learned things and those lessons. I'm hoping that you can offer maybe some advice mm -hmm. that I could share with them or you could share with them because there are a few in the audience here mm -hmm. to help them make that leap, kind of a leap of faith to maybe try sure. something different. Absolutely. So one, don't give me too much credit for being strategic. I can describe it as diversifying your purpose portfolio now upon reflection, but that is not what I was doing at the time. I was desperate to feel valued, and so I just went to where I felt more valued. And then after years, I realized, hey, I was doing all these different things that actually helped me. So the reflection allowed me to articulate it so succinctly, but at the time, it was not that strategic. Um, but I can still share some, some thoughts. So one is, my mom used to say to me that I was like water that when I would hit a wall, I would still run along the water, uh, run along the wall until I would find a crack and slip through the crack, where other people would be more at, like solid matter. They would never see, they would never see the crack. They would never even think that the crack was worth their time. And, and for me, there are very few things that aren't worth my time. And so if I don't have the background in something, formal background, a paid job giving me that, I'll go try to find an organization where I can learn that skill and deliver that skill, typically in the nonprofit world. So much of my professional development has come from industry associations and nonprofits. I might not have had the title of marketing manager at any point in my life, but I assure you I have a wonderful portfolio of repositioning and marketing for multiple nonprofits. And I could also draw that out of my experience, even though I never had that title. So what I find, and this is often more common in women than men, is they'll look at what they don't have and it's almost like these solid blocks. I, do, I must have it or I don't have it. I do have it or I don't. 
when really it's much more fluid than that. What have you done where you can call attention to or give evidence to your ability to think along the lines of fill in the blank? Marketing, general management, labor, scheduling, uh, performa, financial management, bus the general business acumen. Most people have more experience than they realize. Now, you don't want to go too far on that side of the spectrum, which is creating experience that you don't have, because you can let a lot of people down, um, the least of, of which, of course, is not yourself. Uh, but you do need to realize that you have gained experiences in multiple areas. So going through the exercise of asking the right questions of, when have you had to think about what something stood for? That's branding. That's marketing. When have you had to think about what it stood for and how to get people connected to it? That might be something you did in your community, with your church, with your school. There, there are so many ways you could go deep, but someone like you is in the beautiful position of asking those questions to pull it out. And then if, there's, if it's still pretty light, go to a nonprofit. There's a lot of nonprofits that have needs. They have needs of smart people who can help them think critically about important work in the community. And you literally can just go show up and say, I'm a pretty smart person, and I want to get more experience in business, and I'd love to help you work on your branding, your communication, and your marketing, or, or whatever the functionality is. So I would push back and challenge them to think about their background to see if they have more experience than they think. And if they don't, go get it. Don't wait for it. It's not going to show up on your resume you know, miraculously. I'd love to hear more about um, some of the foundations you started uh, when the, the dean mentioned when he introduced you and how you've exercised some of those muscles you developed at Hooters and Cinnabon yeah. in uh, building those organizations. Sure. Um, so I was a part of several nonprofits, started uh, with local communities uh, groups here in Atlanta. Uh, my sister's house, you know, typically because of the way I was raised, having to do with women and children, uh, locations that are are supporting women in need, typically young mothers who are recovering from addiction or leaving battered homes. And so I spent a lot of time with those groups here in, in Atlanta. And then realized I was giving a ton of my either money or time or resources, even though I didn't have a lot of any of those things. And it wasn't in a very thoughtful fashion. It was sort of disparate and scattered and just wherever people had need. And so I started focusing more on parent organizations. So I went to Points of Light. Uh, I went to different care, the care organization and looked at buckets of activity where I really wanted to impact and then started focusing on women and children and then self-sustaining uh, activities through education. So over time what's happened is I've migrated from directly helping and giving to people who are in need to moving to what's the rising tide that lifts their boat, uh, which is typically some form of education, in particular non-traditional skill-based education because that becomes self-sustaining. And then not just education, but education that has job placement as a part of the program. So uh, I am starting my own foundation that pulls together all the work of those many nonprofits and organizations that I've supported that will support people in need who can't afford typically non-traditional education, so writing scholarships, writing grants, um, that gives them 21st century skills and only with organizations that have at least a 90% job placement rate. So I don't write checks unless they have a 90% job placement rate. Because it's not about what they learn, it's what they can do. And so that full, that full cycle is incredibly important. There's a group here, um, which would, I think Terry's already um, connected to and, and learning about called General Assembly. They started in New York. They provide 21st century training skills, and they have a 97% job placement rate and 95% graduation rate. Um, and it's primarily technology-based skills, front end design, back end design, user experience, digital marketing. And, um, but it's $10,000 for 12 weeks, and a lot of people can't afford that. And so I'm focusing scholarships on women and minorities, uh, in particular mothers. So I've got this filter, you know, women, uh, minorities, then women, then if you're a single mom, you're definitely getting the check. <laughs> and, uh, and so um, what's <coughs> happening is this, this type of education, and, I, and Terry and Tech are already connected to General Assembly, I believe, to support and, and really have partnerships because they need academia to be a partner as well, and they can sup be supplementary to traditional education because of their job placement success. Um, that type of thing is where now I want to spend my time. And it's, it's connecting to the startups that I invest in. So it's my own personal foundation to fund self-sufficiency through education. And then I work with Global Hope Network International for the work in uh, Eastern Africa, uh, the care organization here in, uh, based out of Atlanta, but for, for the United States. So I try to keep a good amount of philanthropic and foundation work happening in our backyard. The challenge is a dollar don't go so far <laughs> uh, here. And so it's important to invest in our own country 
but it also is impressive to see the progress you can create in areas where a dollar goes much farther. And, and the reality is the areas of the world where I do a lot more foundation work, Eastern Africa, the Somali border, if things don't get stopped there, I assure you they come here. Um, and so whether it's disease or terrorism, it, you know, it's all kind of brewing in that part of the world. So my foundation work is connected to groups that support self-sufficiency through education, so Global Hope Network in Eastern Africa and the poorest areas of the world, and then um, to literally impact investing through things such as the Acumen Fund and other groups here, uh, based out of New York, but, but in the US, and then my own foundation work here. So you hit on something that's kind of near and dear to my heart when you were talking about 21st century and a little bit of non-traditional approach and um, hitting the individual's purpose in life or what you know what's going to make them productive and uh, successful in in their own terms and so I'm in the construction industry and do a lot with promoting skilled trades amongst high school and technical awesome. school students. So very cool. How would you um, suggest that we continue to to change the mindset of the educators, of the parents that have all been told for 50 years the only way to go to, you know, to be successful is to go to college. So the good news is, much like when I took over Cinnabon, <laughs> there is an environment in which it is pretty obvious that you need to take non-traditional approaches. Um, and so what's interesting is that it's not about not following traditional academia, it's about academia being a part of shaping those non-traditional approaches with private enterprise. So the government's only gonna be able to do so much, and they only should do so much. Um, the private enterprise can only do so much. Academia, particularly advanced uh, academics, have the infrastructure, they understand adult learning, they've got the reputation and the brand, and so there is this three-legged stool of social services, private enterprise, and the academic community that if and when they come together more meaningfully, and I mean literally like a round table every quarter to say, what are the education needs? What are the job placement needs? And then who's got that skill? The private enterprise probably has the money and the resource to invest in their community. And you know what, you should, because you're benefiting from that in terms of building your brand, and you're essentially developing your future employee base. So you're reducing your acquisition costs of talent in the future. So private enterprise, I think, uh, has to take a much more meaningful and literal role in creating apprenticeships, training, and skill-based training, but they need the academic lever for, for the infrastructure, for the approach to, to, to connect to what it takes to actually educate people formally. So I don't think it's, this is sort of also kind of like um, the chat conversation where you don't rip out one and replace the other. You say, how do these things fit together so that we can migrate a traditional, very systemic belief system to something that is more relevant. And that might mean traditional academia, supporting programs that are more skill-based, for sure, for credit hours and things of that nature. It means private enterprise stepping up and writing the checks because they benefit from it. It means the government providing the right incentives and structure uh, for companies that do that and for individuals that are in need. It's, it feels so clear, now again, I'm ticking that off. It's a whole lot of work and a lot of emotion to move people to think a little differently, but when you're asking people to just take two steps over instead of to jump off a cliff, you're way more likely to move it along, and you're giving everyone an opportunity to participate in generating their own longevity instead of asking them to do something that feels as if they're sealing their fate and, and sealing their coffin in terms of their model. It needs to be how do we tweak and work together, and so I think that is a, a big part of it bringing that three-legged stool together. And then reputationally, parents and students will start to see it and understand, and you, then the media plays a role in glamorizing uh, people who've taken non-traditional paths because that is what gets students to then follow the path. So there's a layer of PR and media that has to be on top of non-traditional approaches to glamorize it in the right way so that youth will follow. Good morning. I'd love to hear a little bit more about uh, how you sold the idea to the Cinnabon franchisees of uh, having Cinnabon products in Burger King and uh, that kind of thing. So a few things. Uh, one is we focused on the brand impact. I mentioned that the brand didn't have a lot of marketing reach. So the ability to tell the world we have different stuff was minimal. So we talked about points of distribution. Uh, then I would say so first was the marketing benefit. Then the other was, I, I mentioned I literally a big whiteboard like this drew the line and said, here's where we're headed. So I don't, I don't know how you question a lot of the things that we're going to do, 
But if we believe that the perception that we have more variety is a fundamental belief that we need to create, and we only have this much money to do it, we need to talk to whoever will talk to us, whatever media outlet will talk to us, and whatever business is willing to share that story. Burger King in one region, small anecdote, spent $80 million just marketing the Cinnabon Minibon. My franchisee sales almost doubled in Chicago in that city when they did that for a quarter. So no, I didn't know that in advance. So the selling is a lot harder. Um, so, so that helped. One was we also did a test, a regional test, so we could look at how the business and the consumers were impacted. We also presented research which said, look, the product that we're going to sell at Burger King is going to be primarily purchased breakfast buyers when the malls aren't even open and late night. And so all the research was there that said it's a different occasion. It's a different need state. It's a different consumer. Everything about it was different. But when you're talking about conversations such as this, they aren't logical, they're emotional. So you, you get filleted if you don't have the research. But if you do have the research, it actually doesn't get you very far. But you need to have it anyway because it's the responsible thing to do to make the right decisions. So one was having our ducks in a row in terms of why is this good for the consumer? We started with the customer. People want Cinnabon and they can't find it. They don't go to the mall to get it. This is easier for them. This is a group that can execute this. So we started with what you should always start with, the customer. Then we built to the business. What can the business not do without this? What will this allow us to do? Then we said the magic words, which is here's what's in it for you. And we literally shared in the financial success. I mentioned there was deferred CapEx in the business. So we offset the cost of digital menu boards and physical plant enhancements. And literally when we sent those to the franchisees, I did not miss the opportunity to write a note that said, this comes from Burger King. To remind them to be really excited for every single minivan that was sold at Burger King. We could have just sent it to them, but reminding them of the, it's these strategic alliances and partnerships that are giving us the financial wherewithal to invest in our franchisees in a way that no franchisor would likely be able to invest in a business in that condition. So piece by piece, bit by bit, uh, we started with the you know, the coalition of the willing, the franchisees that were willing to see it was good for the brand. Then we moved to the less willing and used more compelling uh, research and work. Then we went to, here's how you share in the success. And there was still a sliver that hated it, but what they didn't hate were the commensurate sales increases that happened. And that was a three-year contract. It lived its three years. It's done now. The business literally built, as I mentioned, the highest comp sales in 20 years. So it also helped that sales were going like this during that time. It would have been much tougher if the slope had continued. But luckily we were right about that. And when the, what was interesting is when the role came out of Burger King, I had a few of those remaining franchisees that were skeptics and they, because I would say, look, our sales are up and they're like, yeah, but they'd be up more if we weren't in Burger King. I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> so I said, okay, then, then when it goes away, your sales should skyrocket, right? You're saying this is a ceiling on you and it's keeping you from going from 10% comp sales increases, which is industry leading, by the way. Um, you're gonna like go to 12 or 15 or 20, nothing, nothing. Um, so, so there was that. And then there was the fact that it wasn't just Burger King. We truly, as you can see, 75% of the business is in alternative channels. It became the way we said we will build and express our brand. There are only so many malls and there are only so many airports. And there's only uh, so fast you can grow that business to defensively position yourself to keep competition out. Uh, so we used two rules with our franchisees. Every meeting I started with, what is our job? Our job is to one, build the brand for you because why pay us royalties if you're not building the brand? You just open up Bobby Funds and do your own thing. So it, our job is to build the brand so that you're more famous, people are more aware, and if you choose to exit, your investment has more value at the end than at the beginning. So that's our job, build the brand. But our second job as a franchisor is to help you build your profitability. I didn't say it was my job to build their profitability. It's a franchise system, not a corporately owned entity. It's my job to set a franchisee up to be profitable. And what I would tell our franchisees is I should never, ever do one at the expense of the other, ever. I should never be allowed to build the brand at the expense of your profitability. And you should never be allowed to build your profitability at the expense of this brand. And we would give them examples of that. So you're going to hold us accountable, and we're going to hold you accountable. And then we had two rules. Rule one is if we don't, our competition will. Take it or leave it. If we don't, our competition will. And don't come crying to me when a competitive concept decides to enter the market in a non-traditional channel because we have not blocked that space out. So that's one. But the other, the balance to that is just because we can does not mean we should. 
and that's about responsibility and thoughtfulness and doing things that are right for the right reasons, not just being places for the sake of being places. And those were our guiding principles that kept us, you know, there were the bumpers in the bowling alley that kept us from doing wacky things that weren't great for the brand. They also helped us be bold in expanding the brand and retail channels where we really belong. And truly, Cinnabon is considered one of the greatest food brand stories of our time. Uh, because of that. It, it already is a business case in several European business school books. It likely will enter the, the North American business school uh, bi case study market. Uh, it's phenomenal what has happened with that brand, and it would not, could not have happened. And the success of the franchisees could not have happened without multi-channel growth. What's interesting is now I'm in a role where I'm rewinding and having these conversations with five other brands worth of presidents and leaders and franchisees that are all at very different points in their uh, maturation. They all have very different histories in terms of their franchisor and varying degrees of trust with their previous owners. So the good news is we've got a very compelling story with Cinnabon to where they're all saying we want that. We want to be that famous. We want to be in that many places and we want to share in the success. But when it comes down to the blocking and tackling and doing it, it's still an emotional conversation. So it doesn't matter how smart the leader is or how, what your business model is, without a high EQ, without the ability to understand the emotional equation going on underlying anything, you, you couldn't make any change in the business. Hi, Kat. Hey, um, so, so my name is Jack Brandon. Um, I'm actually one of the MBA students here. Nice. <clears throat> so I, I want to say this is probably like the third or fourth time I've heard you speak. Um, Hope first, you're not bored. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> So the first time was about two years ago. Um, you were, it was at Cumberland Mall, you, it was like a conference over there, and, and you gave a speech that really um, spoke to me, and it's actually part of the reason why I chose to pursue my MBA. Nice. So, um, so that was one thing, and uh, it was actually, uh, I, I was starting my first tech startup, actually. Awesome. So I was, I was advertising for my first tech, tech startup, um, which I then have now sold and get ready to start my second tech startup. Good for you. <laughs> Thanks. Cool. Um, so my, my second que or my question for you would be, can you speak a little bit more about your um, your tech startup like uh, experience? Because yeah. this is the first time I've ever heard you mention it before. So yeah, it's you know that I always say don't don't ignore the universe when it pulls you in a direction, I, and I never have. The universe comes calling and I follow. Uh, so I it really started just a couple years ago. Although I've been involved in tech startup for about eight years, the, the strategic involvement that now me looking for it and them looking for me uh, happened over the, just the last couple of years. And it was accelerated by being on the Fortune 40 under 40 list because it is basically tech. It's like all tech. And I am the weirdo on that, in that group. There hasn't been a food person or a chain person on that list ever. Coca-Cola, I think once. So I am the weirdo, and that community loves weirdos. And so even though I stand out, they, you know, they were like, ooh, shiny penny, you know, when I came in. And so, um, so they would all come up and say, oh, can you help us think about our brand and our positioning, and especially the direct-to-consumer uh, tech businesses. So anything that's e-commerce, any type of um, kind of SaaS as a service platform for consumers. And so they just started asking me for help. And I started giving them advice and having lunches, and it was helping. And then I saw, I'm helping you a lot. Maybe I should share some of the benefit here. And so I became an equity holder in a few of the companies through Sweat Equity. And, and then that brought me into the community. And then they said, well, I have this, this startup that's really cool, and they're in a seed round. Do you want to look at them? And so then I started getting tossed opportunities for seed rounds in Series A. And then I invested in a uh, venture capital firm out of Boulder called Merge Lane that focuses on women-founded startups only. It doesn't have to be all women, but they have to have a woman founder. Um, and then out of that, so I'm invested in the VC and then two of the companies, I was so impressed. It's an accelerator also, so I'm a mentor for accelerators around the country. And I fell in love with two of the businesses and so I invested directly in addition to the VC. So it just, you know, it just sort of evolved and now I co-hosted the um, Hack ATL here in Atlanta, I co-host hackathons around the country. I sort of bring the direct-to-consumer business perspective uh, to the hackathons, and I've indoctrinated our organization with a lot of the practices of the technology industry, such as the lean startup model and hackathons and, and things like that that have helped us operate differently as a company. So it, and anything I do that feels very disparate, people go, How, you, seems like your life is here. What, what are you doing over there? They're actually all quite connected, and if they're not, I make them. <laughs> And I take whatever's learning there and then bring it back so we're better as a company. So that's how it got started and um, involved in a lot of direct-to-consumer businesses. And uh, two of the businesses out of Merge Lane, Havenly, 
is a direct-to-consumer uh, site that does in-home design. So for a couple hundred bucks, you literally get a whole design, and then you can link to buying that merchandise also. And in their, I think their last month, they had over a million dollars in sales, and so they're just cranking and tracking. They don't even have a fully built app yet. It's all web-enabled. And then Tomboy X is e-commerce. It's sort of a gender-neutral clothing company that is growing like a crazy, crazy multiple because of the demand for that. Um, and then there are others, a mobile loyalty company called Relevant Mobile that I'm an advisor to, and they do uh, social, local, mobile, all loyalty, uh, integrate mobile payment, total open system for the retail business. And there are several others. But. So um, time management. I don't necessarily believe in time management. Um, I, I believe in a great degree of attention to time. But for me, it's more important to manage energy. It's energy management. So where am I going to get my energy? And what things will I do that pull my energy away? And how do I balance those things? And so that speaks to who I spend my time with, where I go, how long I stay, what my role is. And it directly affects my time management, but I start with energy management. Um, I don't know if you all have read Ariana Huffington's book that just came out, Thrive. It's fantastic. Uh, I really believe in this shift in focus to wellness. The whole, when I mean, people say work-life balance and how do you separate work from life, it, you know, it's kind of weird. Work, personal, harmony, I kind of get at that. But just this concept of overall well-being and how you manage that to the best of your ability is becoming more and more important with the heightened level of stresses that the average human in the developed world experiences today. I mean, you could have a, by anyone's definition, a pretty non-stressful life and still have higher cortisol levels and higher internal stress responses than, our, than humans did 10 years ago because there's just so much coming at you all the time. You're, we're normalized to it, but it's a lot. You, you have an elevated level of internal stress than you would have 10 years ago, even if your life weren't any different. So managing that through social relationships and being healthy and exercise is so, so important. I can't bring the energy that I bring if I don't have that as a foundation. So people say, oh my gosh, you must not sleep. Oh, I sleep. <laughs> and you can tell if I don't. Um, you know, and the minute the wheels go up, my eyes are closed. I'm always looking for little moments to just quiet and rest, and I take those moments as often as I can. Uh, but then life is hectic and busy, and so there are a few tricks. One is don't be too hard on yourself. I'm just not that hard on myself. And if I notice that I'm not able to keep my commitments or things put, you know, start getting pushed a little bit, then it's my job to pay attention to that and scale it back. The second is to keep people around you who are willing to be honest with you. So if you're not showing up in the way you need to show up, family, friends, your coworkers, You've got somebody who's going to be that mirror for you. You should be able to notice it, but you need those people around you that say, hey, you know, you're not around a lot, mom. Or, hey, you know, I'd love for you to spend more time with the employees here. So those two things have always been very helpful for me. Not being too hard on myself. I'm, you know, I'm one person, uh, but I need to manage my, my commitments. But having people who are willing to be honest with me. Good morning, Kat. My name is Ava. Thank you for your visit this morning. Um, I'm an MBA student here, and I'm curious to know, you were already an accomplished business professional. What motivated you to earn your MBA, and how did it benefit your career? Um, great question. So one, I remember I had been at Hooters for, at the time I started um, my MBA at the executive program at, at Georgia State, I had been with Hooters for 14 years. So I had essentially worked in one company most of my professional career. And so I had this inner question, which was, could I duplicate this success somewhere else? Am I really good at my job because I'm actually really good at business? Or am I really good at it because I just know everyone in this company and I've grown up with them and have the relationships to get anything done? I, I thought I knew the answer, but I wasn't sure. So one, it was about proving it to myself, to getting the benchmarks and the best practices and being around other professionals, also seeking um, an you know, a, both a, an economic but more an academic advancement. And I needed, I needed that for myself. The other was I had a, a recruiter in the industry who had tried to pull me away from Hooters for the longest time. And she said, you know, you've built an incredible reputation for yourself in the industry. People know, even without your degree, the fact that you're a college dropout. They, you know, they know all these things. 
and they would still put you in a position to possibly run their companies because of your experience. But the minute you try to go beyond this industry, that is going to matter a whole lot less. And so she just said, you need to think about that. You need to think about the fact that it would be a shame to have a door not open to you where you could actually walk through and make a change because you haven't pursued and finalized your academic um, evolution, essentially. And so it was those two things that caused me to uh, pursue the MBA. The experience, as I know you all are experiencing here, is phenomenal. It is um, shaped by the faculty and their business experience and their ability to bring real world application to the table, which is um, typically at the highest levels in executive MBA programs. And then your cohort, your peers, people who are very different on very different journeys, uh, and learning from them and being reminded that Sometimes you get a little comfortable in your company and in your role, and when you have to get work done with a new team, you, it's a brutal mirror of your style and theirs, and so it's a beautiful personal development opportunity. And so out of that, I built relationships with faculty and cohort that helped me think about business differently um, and truly had a personal growth experience through that as well. But I didn't do it for the reasons a lot of people do. I wasn't pursuing a specific job. I was already a vice president of an 800 million, now $900 million company at the time. I was not looking to leave. It was not my goal. I just, it was those other two things that I mentioned that made me say, yeah, this is probably the right thing if I can do it. And it was particularly tough because I was the chair of the board of the Georgia Restaurant Association at the time. Our CEO had died and we were in the process of selling our company. And so adding the MBA, the nights and weekends to it, I really didn't sleep for two years. Um, but you know what, I met people who, there was a woman in my class who literally day two, she was an executive in her company, had a child. Day two, and she finished. And I'm like, who am I to complain, <laughs> you know? So getting your bar reset too on what's possible, uh, possible in personal and professional management is also a benefit um, that I took from it. And of course, the content, um, because I knew the real world of business, I could shape and make things happen in any brick and mortar operation, any retail business. I also did not have the language, a very sophisticated business language. I certainly hadn't gone through formal um, financial training in any way. So the ability to understand capital structures, to have those conversations, not only was it fundamental to my business growth as a leader, but we were, as I mentioned, selling Hooters at the time. So I would go to class nights and weekends and show up back Monday meeting with attorneys, analysts, and investors and think, thank God I went to class because I understand what they're saying. And more importantly, I can speak in a language that conveys what I mean in a language that they understand. So I can talk about the valuation of the company in, in a language that will allow the most of our strengths to come through, whereas the week before, I might not have been able to. And so it was very timely in that regard also. Great. Well, thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Kat. I have two presents for you. It's our tradition to provide a sculpture. Beautiful. Uh, note the color scheme of red and thank black. Thank you. Very nice. <laughs> and you also, will, in our new <laughs> learning community, we're going to have a brick placed in your honor for, to commemorate today's presentation. Cool beans. So thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Very cool. Awesome.